All right, hello everybody. Welcome to Coffee Kegs and Creek Spill. And you're looking at a black screen simply because our uh, OBS is uh, not cooperating, which is pretty typical. Uh, I think it went through an update and I foolishly updated it right before the event. Uh, but I wanted to come on live on time and I just have to figure out how to do this and there we are all right we're all good we're in business uh, we're looking at a module mostly because it's the first one I was able to pull up uh, I did play a game on this yesterday and I think it was asymmetrical and today we're going to talk about asymmetry in Kriegspiel we do have some guests on tap uh, Alex in particular is going to uh, come here and grace us with his presence I'm going to invite him to speak uh, I'll also invite uh, Achilles and uh, Otto, who are in the audience, if they wish. They may decline or they can uh, pop up if they have some things they want to say. Uh, but what I want to talk about is asymmetry in Kriegspiel. And I'm going to give you the good part first, which is my opinion on it. And then we're going to open it up to Alex and Otto, who are here. Uh, and we'll talk about it in the context of some games and, and, and some other things. Um, but the question is, should you have asymmetry in a Kriegspiel game? And asymmetry refers to this condition where one side has a much more substantial force than the other side. So you might have one side that outnumbers the other side 2 to 1, 3 to 1, or something like that. Uh, you may also have a condition where you have an army that fights one way, and another army that fights another way. So in our red versus blue campaign, for example, one common example of asymmetry is you have these large Napoleonic formations which are encountered by smaller guerrilla formations that do not fight in the Napoleonic style. What do you do in those situations? That's asymmetry in warfare. And should you have it? And my answer is absolutely if it is a campaign. If you're playing a one-off event <laughs> where you are simply playing for fun and it's simple red team versus blue team, I don't. I, I think the game should be fair and balanced. In fact, I think even uh, Verdi talked about this in his uh, writings that you know the game should generally be fair. I'm going to promote our guests, by the way, who are here so they can manipulate things and work with the board. Um, on the other hand, if you are running a campaign event and one side manages to outmaneuver the other or they do the work that is required to gain an overwhelming advantage on the battlefield, whether that's they're going to, they concentrate their forces and drive down towards the objective or maybe another side outmaneuvers the other and accomplishes a defeat in detail situation, Yes, you run the battle as an asymmetrical battle, even though it means one side is going to be completely humiliated, because that's the reward for that kind of planning. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is an exception would be if you are using this as an educational tool. Let's say you want to teach or illustrate or train a particular scenario, then obviously all of that goes out the window and the training is the thing and you allow that to inform how you construct the scenario. But if you're just playing a friendly quick game and it's a one-off, I would say balance it. If on the other hand you are playing a game that is supposed to be a campaign where results carry over, then I'm all about asymmetry. I think it's glorious. I think you should have it even though one side is going to hate it. It teaches them to be more judicious or to change their tactics or do something else. It's a better simulation of reality, and that's why I think people play campaigns. Uh, all right, we have a couple people here. Alex was going to come on, and I see that Otto is setting up the map. So both people have something to say. Uh, Alex, are you here? Are you uh, available? Yeah, I'm here. All right, Alex, go ahead and, and take a few minutes while Otto uh, gets everything set up, and then we're going to pitch it over to Otto, and he's going to talk about this uh, scenario we played yesterday which to me felt like an asymmetrical scenario, but I'm not sure. But we're going we're gonna to let him uh, uh, cue in. And um, you go ahead, Alex. What are your thoughts on asymmetry in Creeksville, please? Um, first thing is, 
uh, I'm not really going to talk much about on campaign because I think in a campaign asymmetry will all. It's literally impossible to have a bounce scenario in a campaign because that includes many players. And one of the things that bounces the campaign is your order of battle, your map set, and your players. Like, um, if we have a play, an experienced player like. Uh, in our audience, we have Lord Hugs. He's played a lot of games, and he's leading one side. And then you put someone who's completely new to Kriegspiel leading the others. His side will probably have an advantage just because he's played more, right? But I think what we really want to approach, how we want to approach this question, is with scenario play, which is I think how most games of Kriegspiel are played anyway. Mm-hmm. And I actually mm-hmm. think that. N- First of all, I think it's the same thing. It's impossible to create a truly balanced scenario, if only because of the map. The order of battles can be exactly the same, but let's say we're playing on the Gettysburg map, and one side starts closer to Cemetery Hill, they probably have the advantage, because that's a hill that dominates half the battlefield. Because they can just take it first. Right. But, I also think it's important that you don't have to balance your scenarios. And the viewpoint I have for this is normal war games. Let's take uh, most D-Day war games, for example, like Hex Encounter ones. Mm -hmm. I think it's generally accepted that if you play the German side in those games, you will get destroyed. It's inevitable. The Germans don't have enough material. They don't have enough counters. They're just outpowered. Then it's like, well, what's the fun in playing Germans in that game? Because you're trying to play out a battle. You're Mm -hmm. trying to see, hey, what's going to happen? And I think most Kriegspiel scenarios are the same way. It doesn't have to be perfectly balanced. You're trying to play out a battle. And I think play as you should expect your players to approach it in the same way. Hey, sometimes I'm in what may be a no-win scenario, a true Kabayashi Maru. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to go in and do the best I can. I mean, you know, make sure you preserve your force. Maybe you just delay them. Right. You you adjust the, the win conditions for each <laughs> side so that, for example, the side that's outnumbered, their win condition might be to delay the enemy for a period of time. Let's say you're simulating a rearguard action, or another win condition might be to preserve a certain quantity of your force or to hold out for a certain duration. So that's how you would adjust the win-loss objective so that the team that's expected to be crushed can still win the scenario, but they do so not by commanding the battlefield, but by holding ground for a certain amount of time or something like that. All right, I want to... Well, um, well, go ahead, Alex. Go ahead, Alex. I was just going to add on that. I, I think it depends on your players, too. Because for some people, playing Kreutzbill isn't about winning the scenario. It's just about being a general. And Mm -hmm. an example Mm -hmm. I'd like to bring up is the very first game I ever played before we were at IKS to SoCal Society still. Yeah. (laughs) Um, It was, uh, I just blanked on the map name. It was a Civil War game. Shiloh? Was it Shiloh? It wasn't Shiloh. It was the one after that. Lynchburg. Uh, Lynchburg? Lynchburg. Yep. Yep. It would have been Lynchburg. uh, That scenario was blatantly unbalanced. It was like four Confederate brigades versus eight Union. And... Uh, it was obvious from, like, if you look at the design of the scenario, there's no way the Confederates are going to win this. They're given the expectation, like, but the way they were briefed is as if they had the forces to, because they are promised reinforcements that never arrived. That's right. I and remember so, that. yeah. I think you can have a lot of situations like that, where one player, one side just blatantly cannot win the scenario, but that's fun. Like, there's a mm-hmm. lot of war games out there where that's fun. One of my favorite war games is West Front, where, which is a 1943-1945 Western Front World War II. You never, you can never win as the Germans. The Allies will always completely obliterate you. But it's so fun to do it because every time you play, you get a little bit better. Yeah. And I think Kriegsbill yeah. tends to shake out the same way. <laughs> Agreed. All right, Otto, uh, you're up. Uh, Otto's here, and Otto has set up the map. I'll zoom in a little bit so he can uh, talk and should be able to draw on the map. Uh, Otto, welcome to Coffee, Kegs, and Kriegsbill. Uh, thanks. So, yeah, I hosted yesterday's World War Two game you played in, and this is the end game state of it. I agree with everything that Alex said. Um, I'm not sure if I have much to add. I've now hosted 
I think le in the last two weeks I counted and I've counted that in the last two weeks I've hosted 12 uh, live World War II Eastern Front games and all of them have been asymmetrical and it's always uh, it's usually to the disadvantage of the Soviets as they are set in the first year of Operation Barbarossa mm -hmm. in the Baltic and in this scenario the Soviets were outnumbered 2 to 1 and they were were absolutely outgunned in every aspect and they were mostly crushed uh, in the scenario but the Germans still thought that they 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 were still Germans were still disappointed in themselves because they had suffered some unnecessary casualties yeah um, as I recall we, we established a line here yes and then the Germans mm -hmm. kind of just went straight up the middle is what it looked like to me uh, but across the front, they came in here, here, and here, and eventually drove through here, thanks to me. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you can see that there was two, uh, there was, from the umpire table, there were two concentrated German attacks, one here uh, near Yudiskiai, and one near your position. Mm -hmm. And you even have sun. You even had two of your entire platoons annihilated by um, <laughs> German artillery fire in 15 minutes. So you lost 60 men in 15 minutes uh, before <laughs> wow. the German attack. So it was quite fun looking at it. Um, I had a great time, even though I was on the receiving end. I I had fun, and if you're playing just for fun, uh, and you have fun, then in a way you win. You know. So yeah, I think you know, yeah, yeah I think it's with asymmetrical scenarios uh, it's actually I think you can always have fun as the defender because you're always getting into action even though you might be crushed really quickly but if you are an attacker and you're basically bashing your head against the wall it might I don't know I always try to I think it's more it can be more fun defending uh, in an asymmetrical scenario than attacking but i don't know i've had i've had uh, games where the attackers have failed and they haven't quit the game either um this morning i play i hosted another world war ii game uh where the soviets um where didn't have any at equipment and it was the first game ever so far where the germans had had tanks so it was a quite a shock for the soviets since they had not planned combating tanks in any any sort of way and they heard heard the rumble of engines in the distance in the beginning of the game yeah so, yeah i think it was a brilliant scenario uh, a beautiful system by the way i hope you write uh, everything up and we get it out there for others to use um i i just had i had a blast uh, and my 60 men also had a blast it seems but anyway <laughs> it was a good time achilles is here and achilles uh, i'm gonna call on him to speak because he he accepted the invitation so he's up in here um and uh, i think achilles has read a book or something about about the army i don't know uh, but uh, he's going to come up here and, and, and talk. And Achilles, you said in the comments that this is a subject near and dear to your heart. Uh, can you uh, enlighten us on that, please? That or he's still muted. I got him muted. Well, maybe maybe he'll pop in in a minute. He may be getting his coffee too. But Achilles, when you pop back, uh, if you can, or drop a note in the comment if you're having a technical issue. Um, Alex, what did you want to add to that? Did you? I heard you speak up. I thought maybe you had something there. Um. Well, the first thing is, uh, the first thought I had was I love. I, I love shock scenarios, which is what Otto was describing with the tanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's necessary sometimes. And one of my favorite things about them is if if you write them, you can write them in a way where the Germans know 100% that they're going to face no resistance. And that definitely changes how the players will plan. Um, looks like Achilles dropped. Uh, 
Yeah, that's okay. But usually, when most umpires write that scenario, usually in the terms to make it interesting, you make the Germans think that they are going to face at least some AT resistance, which makes them a little more cautious. And you have to force the players to have an aha moment when they realize that there's nothing in their way and they can just completely steamroll the enemy. Um, which is just, I don't know, it's fun to watch. Uh, and it seems like players usually enjoy that kind of thing. I mean, mm-hmm. can't ever tell. But uh, <laughs> you know, it's more fun to torture them. Uh, <laughs> That's why you umpire. So you can torture uh, them. <laughs> but the, another thought I... Because I, I always talk about how fun it is to defend... And I thought how interesting it might be to have, even to start thinking how un- other ways you can un- unbalance a scenario. Like suppose you have a scenario where the larger force has to defend, and the smaller force has to attack. That's that's rather unusual. Usually, you give the larger force the burden of the attack because, right? You just normally you don't attack with the smaller force. But that happened all the time, like in history. And there's mm-hmm. quite a few you know, decent examples of it. Uh, like Gettysburg, I suppose, is a big example. Uh, the one that j- literally just popped in my head because I was looking at this World War II system was um, uh, Easy Company's attack of, I think, Raycor Manor on mm. uh, on D-Day, which should have won a should have won a Medal of Honor, it didn't, and um, things like that, where you really have to think create creatively to use your forces, mm-hmm. but still on both sides because. What will also happen is, if the big if if the bigger side doesn't know that they're bigger, they still might do something really cautious. And right. I guess kind of going round about. <laughs> sorry to be so long winded about it. Um, I think a lot of your balancing is meant to be mental. It's you could have one side that's ten times bigger than the other, but if they don't think that they're ten times bigger for whatever reason, then they're going to act like it for at least a portion of the game. Right. Right. And uh, again, again, that's another way you can balance stuff, is is the scenario itself. And there's nothing wrong with flying the players in the scenarios. Uh, when I run games, which is rarely, but I'm actually working <laughs> on the system to start doing it again. Uh, I love flying the players in the scenarios. All the time. <laughs> All the time, because it changes how you think, and it's no fun when you know everything. Right, right. So sometimes you'll get a tip that's like, oh, and the enemy has been spotted in this town here, even though you know that they're never going to, there's probably, they might send like a, you know, a Hazar squadron there, but nothing else, but it's, it'll change how they think. Yeah. Because a lot of times your Intel is, is flawed or dated. Um, yeah, that happens all the time. I want to go to a few comments. Achilles didn't pop in, which is unfortunate. I would have loved to hear from him. Um, he can perhaps, uh, write comments too in the YouTube later. Uh, so if he has something to say, I don't know. He's been up there where we're we've been getting all these storms here in California. He's been getting hit pretty bad. Uh, he's been uh, without power and internet uh, for most of the past week. So we give him a pass. But let's take a look at some of the comments. Robert says, "Nope, life isn't fair. Why should the game be? This is only if I have the overwhelming army." <laughs> so I guess if he's on the receiving end, he'll he'll say, you know, it should be fair. Uh, but I agree that, you know, again, if you're playing a campaign, the reward for the side that has forced the asymmetrical engagement is that overwhelming advantage. They've earned that. And they, they should not be deprived of that for gameplay purposes. Because that's why you run a campaign. If you just want to do a balanced game, do a balanced game as a one-off. But if you're doing a campaign, you have to give people the prize that they worked very hard for. Uh, Robert says, what about tactics? The only true ace or tactics too. the only true asymmetrical game. I'm not too familiar with it, unfortunately. Um, uh, Robert says the armies are the same and the map is a mirror image. Uh, I guess that yeah, Robert comes... and I talked about that in the comments. Uh, all right. If it, I guess to kind of explain tactics too to people mm-hmm. who are watching this post, you know, after it's been broadcast, it's a 1950s Avalon Hill box game mm. and the game is two army groups they're exact the same order of battle um it's like eight tank divisions 25 infantry divisions yeah yeah two yeah um and then the map the only asymmetry is the map uh and um the like the armies are really similar and it's 
95% balanced, but the bottom army is closer to these mountains on the right-hand side of the map, mm -hmm. which gives them a ma like map advantage, basically. Yeah. And it's one of those things that like you go, well, that doesn't matter. But if you play the game like 60 times, then you start realizing that occupying the mountains is a huge advantage because the armies are so equal. And, uh, you know, it becomes more unbalanced. But not so much that it matters. Or, sorry, not so much that it matters that, like, you know, you're never going to win as a top army. It just kind of makes it a little skewed. Yeah, all right. I'm showing a little picture I pulled up on the internet of the map so people have some sense of what we're talking about there. But, all right, let's go back to the comments real quick. Um, and let's see here... Lord Hugs, who's actually in the peanut gallery, and if you've ever heard Lord Hugs talk, that's why I'm reluctant to invite him to speak, but he says, well, if both sides don't truly know the numbers, which is pretty normal nowadays, you don't need it to be fair to pull a win. All right. So um, Lord Hugs has recently read some books, I think. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and invite him to speak against my better judgment, and if he wants to pop up and share some thoughts, he can do so. Um, I would kind of like to know his approach to uh, how you win if you don't know the numbers. You know, what do you do? Uh, for me, knowing the enemy, knowing the numbers uh, is the biggest part of the battle. You have to scout. I always say you have to scout. I'm always saying this. You have to scout. You have to feel out the enemy and know what is going on. Uh, in order to have make an informed decision otherwise you're just you know blundering blindly into your opponent and uh, that's not going to produce a very good result but look here lord hugs is here uh, let's see what he has oh. to add uh profanity hello. filter on uh, good luck hello lord hugs how you doing man how's it can going you, up there can you can you hear me i hear you loud and clear man okay yeah sorry i, I did change to my phone because i was sitting on my computer um but uh no, dude, this this California weather is crazy, man. It's been we raining for like two weeks. Yeah, you're so right I up there to... next to Achilles, and I'm I'm about a <laughs> yeah. hundred or so miles south of y'all. But <laughs> um, but yeah, like to kind of add to the or you, I'm sorry, the, the question was like, what do I do? Like when the scenario is unfair or like unbalanced? Well, you you made a comment. A lot of unbalanced mm -hmm. historical scenario win conditions for the underpowered side is do better than what was done historically. You said that, and then you added. Well, if both sides don't truly know the numbers, which you said is pretty normal nowadays, you don't need it to be fair to pull a win. Uh, are you able to right. explain that? Well, it depends. Are we talking about one-off battles or are we talking about campaign-wise? Because it's a little different. Well, talk about both. Let's illustrate the Okay, difference. okay. Well, I'll, I guess I'll start with campaigns then because I'm actually active in uh, Carter's monstrosity of the American Civil War <laughs> campaign. Um, but, uh, yeah, like you you have to get really creative um like definitely thinking outside the box is something you need to do um because it, 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 you have to know a little bit about the mentality i think alex uh, uh mentioned this earlier but um kind of like understanding who the opponent is kind of helps me out specifically a lot um but see this this is kind of it's kind of interesting to um so, like, campaign-wise, typically what you want to do is you want to split up their their big superior force and then kind of, like, defeat it in detail, which is kind of, like, how we're trying to do it in the in the campaign. Um, but you also, like, in the context of a campaign, there's, like, other parameters that maybe will, like, uh, um, give you an edge that maybe the other side didn't really think about. Um, like, for example, like, our Navy. I don't want to give away too much with the, the, the campaign, but it's already, like, in the newspaper in, in the game, but um, kind of like to balance out the naval war in the CSA, you know, um, the Union would have never thought that we would actually, like, invest heavily in our Navy, but we did the exact opposite because they weren't expecting it. Mm -hmm. So we turned around and bought a bunch of ships from Britain, and, and now we can actually, like, fight them, mm -hmm. uh, like, on, on the ocean. Um, so, and, and we did that with a very, very small economy compared to the Union, but, like, um, being able to prioritize, like, what we want to do um, kind of like let us focus in on certain things and, and again they weren't really expecting it so kind of like playing into the mentality of like they typically right, what I see right. when, when someone when someone knows that they're powerful they take things for granted and that's what you want to capitalize on yeah that's you know a great if, if that makes sense yeah no that's an excellent point 
you know, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe this gets back to auto, um, but, uh, you know, if one side has superiority in artillery, uh, then you can expect that they're probably going to lead with artillery there then rather than some other tactic. And um, they're going to deploy their forces in anticipation of artillery fire, in which case then uh, whether you're either the attacker or, or the defender, you can adjust for that. It's kind of like, you know, I know that you know that I know kind of a scenario. Therefore, <laughs> yeah. I've got to I've got to change it up somehow. Yeah. Uh, well, I, would, one... I, I would like to ask Otto uh, before we wrap up here, I would like to ask him if uh, he sees players uh, kind of following the script or if they try to do something to surprise the enemy. In particular, I would say, uh, are the Soviets trying to sometimes surprise the Germans, knowing that they are outnumbered, knowing that they are over, uh, underpowered? Uh, I would like to know if in the past 12 games he's seen anything clever from the Soviets. Yeah, so, so well, I kind of fit it. I kind of fit and think it fits the uh, Soviet... Uh, the theme of Soviet soldiers having inexperienced officers in the early years of the war, since a lot of the players are still figuring stuff out, since they have they are coming mostly from Napoleonic games. But we have had some players who have played the Soviets quite a bit and basically are more familiar with the with how modern warfare, modern combat works. There was a small counter attack in this game for example and there have mm -hmm. been quite a few counter attacks uh, in the world war ii games so yeah they oh i'm not sure i'm not sure if i can really say because uh people was they, none, no one has really gotten comfortable with their enemy yet at this point and they're kind of getting trying to get used to modern combat so no one has really pulled out any nice hat tricks other than some small concentrated counter attacks all right well that happens and as people learn just like the historic or real war and real wars all in time past there is a learning curve where both sides kind of learn how to fight and how to adjust according to the conditions and the material circumstances and so on and then, of course, the war uh, really kind of fires up. Uh, and we're seeing this real in real life. We're seeing this in the Russia-Ukraine war as the Russians are kind of now figuring out uh, how to fight in Ukraine against the local defenders there. And I don't really want to get into that conversation because I don't want to get political or anything like that. But just from a Kriegspiel perspective, it appears to me that the Russians are, are learning. Um, and that's going to happen in your Kriegspiel games. That will happen in your campaigns in particular. It will also happen if you have the same players participating in a series of one-offs. You will have this situation where over time players will get used to the system. Uh, they may become more familiar with the maps. They'll become familiar with uh, their opponents. And they'll begin to change the way that they play. And again, it's always good, you know, if you're just doing a series of one-offs to change it up on them, which gives them a little bit of a surprise and an exercise. Uh, and, but if you're doing a campaign, I really do think you have to allow the players to create these imbalanced situations. And then their payoff, their reward for all of that hard work is usually a big win. Uh, or it could also be a big defeat if the other team manages to fight as the underdog successfully. Uh, that's always a possibility as well. So there you have it. Uh, it also highlights just how important intelligence is. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Dude, and yeah. <laughs> Robert says scouting is overrated. Blindly attacking is into the enemy is the greatest tactic I know. Works perfectly for me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I agree. You know, you do. You have to seuss something out about your opponent. You have to figure some things out so that you're making an informed decision. Uh, on the other hand, uh, and this is where I wish Achilles were here, uh, sometimes you have to balance that out with the need to act and to get inside an opponent's OODA loop. Because well, if yeah, you spend yeah, yeah. too much time on intel gathering, 
the enemy is moving and operating the situation is dynamic and fluid it's changing on you and all of a sudden when you finally get everything set up and ready to go you're actually you've actually planned and prepared for a scenario that no longer exists and now you're the one who's going to be in trouble and i think you, i think you, you might know uh, a little bit about that hugs because like i yeah. said you've read a book now <laughs> I <laughs> I think I think a good way that I like to look at it is uh plan for the map and then use intelligence to figure out the rest. Mm. You know, cuz like oh, you can kind of look at a map and like look at the terrain. Like here's some hills, here's some rivers, here's some, you know, and and then like in a context of campaign, you have a general idea of where the enemy's going to be at and what they're doing anyways. Um a one-off battle, it it just depends. You're at the umpire's mercy at that point. But specifically in the context mm -hmm. of a campaign, um it's like Plan plan your stuff based on the map and what you want to accomplish, not what the enemy is accomplishing, but what you want to accomplish, and then get an idea of what they have and where, roughly where they're at, and and then make adjustments to that plan like as you go. Mm -hmm. that, um, that's that's typically what's worked pretty well for us, uh, like in in our campaigns so far. That's good advice. All right, well, it's time to wrap up, but I want to thank everyone who was on today. Alex, Otto, Lord Hugs. Wow, Lord Hugs, you got through it without any F-bombs. Uh, I'm really stoked. You're growing up, man. Um, <laughs> I one love small you. step for man. <laughs> right? Yep. One giant leap for Lord <laughs> Hugs. Leap for man. Yeah. <laughs> Otto, I want to thank you for sharing uh, your content with us. It's uh, a beautiful system and scenario. I had a great time in yesterday's game, and it was really cool to uh, play an asymmetrical game and learn some lessons from it. I also want to thank um, those of you in the comments and uh, Achilles, who you know is probably you know knocked offline again as as it happens. They are getting hit with storms right now, uh, but uh, I hope he can watch the recording and maybe clue in uh, or chime in on some of the chat later. Uh, but I want to thank you all for being here. And this has been Coffee, Kegs, and Kriegspiel, and we will see you on the next adventure.